wildly entertaining. Um, so archives and libraries are, this is my title, my, my talk obviously is titled Preservation Aesthetics. Archives and libraries are intensely aesthetic environments. Libraries in particular have historically been among our grandest buildings, and today, with an increasingly diverse program and patron base, it's the source of many sounds and textures and smells. Information reaches us in various forms and materialities. We store that information on bookshelves and server racks, and we access it on tabletops and laptops and through interfaces. Our engagement with these furnishings, both physical and virtual, is a multi-sensory experience. Aesthetics are particularly germane to the world of preservation that takes place within the work of preservation, that is, that takes place within these institutions. As you well know, one of preservation's central concerns is determining whether something has intrinsic value based on its uniqueness of informational content, age, physical format, artistic or aesthetic qualities, and scarcity, and if so, then safeguarding the original item. These aesthetic variables have huge epistemological significance. Acknowledging archives and libraries as aesthetic entities not only helps patrons to better understand how they think and learn, but it also ideally helps practitioners to recognize that the physical and digital environments they create aren't neutral containers of information. They give shape to data, information, knowledge, and history, condition how patrons access and process them, and in the process, constitute what those intellectual constructs are. At the New School in New York, I regularly teach a graduate seminar that explores the history, value, politics, and aesthetics of archives, libraries, and databases. We focus not only on the aesthetics of the institutions themselves, the library's rows of books, the archives' dusty boxes, um, quite a tri tri uh, oft-repeated trope, and the databases' interfaces, but also on the flood of archive-related and data-driven art that's been get generated in recent years. In this presentation, I'll examine a group of artists who take up issues pertinent to digital, pre digital preservation, file formats, versioning, migration, the lifespan of storage devices, metadata, digital decay, etc., as well as their pre-digital precursors. By pushing certain protocols to their extreme or highlighting snafus and limit cases, these artists' works, these artists' work often brings into stark relief the conventions of preservation practice and poses potential creative new directions for that work. As I hope to show, practicing archivists, librarians, and database managers, as well as a host of people in a host of other roles, and the patrons who use those resources have much to learn about the nature of their enterprise from artists. So the first section. I'd like to first distinguish between the preservation of the aesthetic and the aesthetics of preservation. The former, let's say, refers to practices of preserving the intrinsic value of, origi of original objects, one application in which these practices have been given careful consideration, and which is probably especially pertinent to this group, is the preservation of digital art. You have plenty of folks here today who know a lot more about this than I do, so I won't say too much about it. And you want to quickly address how the rubrics and best practices developed by organizations committed to the preservation of new media art offer frameworks and vocabularies that can help us to better appreciate the aesthetics of preservation, my second category. And by that, I mean the sensory contemplation of preservation itself, and particularly for my purposes here, art that takes as its subject matter, uh, art that takes as its subject matter, the practices, values, politics, politics, ethics, and especially the limitations of preservation. But first, returning quickly to the preservation of the aesthetic, that first category. Various consortia of scholars, artists, and archivists have been concerned with the preservation of new media art in light of the inevitable obsolescence of digital platforms. One such group, the Variable Media Network, whose purview extends beyond the digital to encompass any art um, that exists or resides on potentially unstable platforms, is dedicated to understanding a work's, quote, behavioral characteristics and intrinsic effects, end quote. There's that word again, intrinsic independent of the medium in which that work is created and displayed. Forging the Future's Variable Media Questionnaire captures information about artwork's various behaviors and medium-specific aspects, including how the work is contained, installed, performed, how it's made interactive, how it's reproduced, encoded, and networked. There are then four main strategies, storage, emulation, migration, and reinterpretation, for preserving variable media so as to responsibly address these behavioral characteristics. Of course, you know this already. I also want to point out that John Apolito told me last night about a book that was published just last, 
last month uh, that addresses a lot of these issues. And uh, reading a description of it, I ordered it immediately. It looks fantastic, so I highly recommend it. But what about the aesthetics of these preservation practices themselves? What if we consider not only how the aesthetic qualities of, say, a Namjoon Pike installation are preserved in a reconstruction of the original work, but also how the practice of reconstruction, or emulation, or migration, or even storage, has its own aesthetics and attendant politics, poetics, etc. Upon beginning this project, I knew of a few artworks and exhibitions that grappled with these issues. But I asked my new school colleague, Christian Paul, for other recommendations. So she's a curator of new media art at the Whitney Museum, and she's long been a central figure in discussions regarding the preservation of net art. There isn't much art, digital art that explores preservation-related issues, she said, because, quote, most artists understandably would consider it too boring, end quote. <laughs> well, OK. Um, and I do want to thank Christiana for directing my attention to several illuminating examples particularly of works that highlight preservation by defying it, or highlighting its limitations. I'll only briefly explore a few of these examples, because once again, there are folks in the room who know this work much better than I do, and heck, some of this work is yours. Um, to start, we have examples of the self-erasing disk, the self-destructing file, the self-deteriorating page, for example, William Gibson and Dennis Ashpaw's Agrippa, about which Matt has written beautifully. We also have digital artists who highlight the volatility of data models, net architecture, and storage media by building intentionally irreverent, idiosyncratic, unstable archives, or by constructing hypertext narratives meant to disintegrate with advancing link rot. For example, 3.org's The Unreliable Archivist, as you see here, and Olia Lialina's Anna Karenina Goes to Paradise. We have artists aestheticizing the hard drive and other storage technology, reminding us of the materiality of the digital object and of memory. Here we see Emmanuel Palou's 10 million uh, terabytes, 10 million dollars, one terabyte, and Jason Loeb's Anthropomemoria, which I saw recently at uh, the Swiss Institute in New York. We have artists highlighting the questionable veracity of emulation, using as their primary source material their own memories of the spirit, hardly a reliable historical record of historical technology. And again, um, the Alina's and Dragon Aspen Sheets once upon, as you can see here. We have artists transforming the process of digital preservation and emulation into performances and framing the documentation of those practices or those processes as aesthetic objects. For example, Jody's Jet Set Willie, Jet Set Willie variations uh, and the new museum's transfer station, which I'm, there are representatives here that we'll be talking later in the conference. So in aestheticizing the failures and limitations of digital tools and techniques, they make manifest, perceptible, aesthetically experiential, the underlying values, tacit politics, and invisible structuring structures, to be all Bourdieuian, of preservation. So the next section, the aesthetics of creative destruction. I imagine the territory I've covered thus far is familiar for some, if not most of you. What I ultimately want to argue in this next section, and this is where I think I might finally be able to share something maybe you don't already know about, is that there are plenty of analog precedents and contemporary analog counterparts to these digital works. And there's much to be learned by historically contextualizing these aesthetic concerns central to digital preservation in examining how core preservation principles extend across materialities and media. Agrippa is actually a great example of the latter point. Not only did the floppy disk storing Gibson's electronic poem encrypt itself after a single use, but the pages of Ashbaugh's book, artist book, in which that disk was embedded, were also treated with photosensitive chemicals and erased themselves over, to, over a period of time. We thus see here two different material processes, two different time frames, two different aesthetic experiences of preservation and decay, of memory and forgetting. In addition, surrounding the work we find different paratexts and pirate practices that aim to subvert the logics and aesthetics built into these original embedded objects. There's been a long history of artwork that eats itself, that defies its own preservation. Gustav Metzger wrote, wrote about auto-destructive art in 1959, but well before we had the term to label the practice, we had plenty of self-destructive self precedent, much of it rooted in Dada and futurism, and motivated by iconoclastic desire to demolish the hegemonic museum, the aesthetic canon, and a good taste. The 1920s brought Max Ernst's sculpture with attached axe, 
and Francis Picabia's erased blackboard drawings, and 30 years later, we had Rauschenberg's erased de Kooning drawings. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Gutai Art Association, <coughs> whose name translates to embodiment, shot at and tore through their artworks, celebrating the creative potential of destruction. Rauschenberg then collaborated with Jean Tungley on Homage to New York, a kinetic sculpture that worked itself into a fiery frenzy in the Museum of Modern Arts Sculpture Garden in 1960. MoMA has preserved a fragment of this piece in its collection, which of course raises questions about what exactly is being preserved here. Just a few years after Tongli's pyrotechnics, Yoko Ono sat on a stage and invited guests to come up and cut away her clothes. Art history scholar Christine Stiles suggests that projects like Ono's cut piece are like much destruction art and that they, quote, take the body as the principal site of destruction. But this work also exemplifies women's specific stake in destruction because it explores the obliteration of identity, too. Stiles thus reminds us that much of this work is rooted not only in the rejection of the, of the authoritarian institution, but also in artists' frustration over their own otherness or statelessness and their, quote, profound disgust and rejection of the patriarchal models of discipline, punishment, violence, and authoritarianism, end quote. We should consider how these forces are grappled with in the act of preservation, too, and perhaps where preservation falls short in citing such drives to destruct and delete. Ono's London performance, which tellingly elicited such aggressive responses from visitors that a security force had to be engaged, was part of Metzger's 1966 Destruction in Art Symposium, where visitors found, <clears throat> quote, Tony West running classic books through a crank meat grinder, Shrive artfully burning large photos of Willie Brandt, Al Hansen exploding a big motor scooter, Ralph Orreads demolished a piano with a sledgehammer, um, Pro Diaz exploded type of type pyrotechnic powders and fuse cords on three large painted surfaces. John Latham burnt several scoop towers of Encyclopedia Britannica's. <coughs> Wolf Vostel of Germany destroyed TV images with paint, food, and manual controls. So many of these historical examples remind us that some art, much like digital archival material, requires enactment. These weren't simply there to be looked at. They have to be turned on, or played, refreshed, reenacted, migrated to new platforms. This history also reminds us of the centrality of embodiment, a quality central to emulation-based preservation, and of the variation inherent in reinterpretation. Gustav Metzger's own work, he's the one who, who um, coined the phrase autodestructive art. He made paintings made of acid on nylon screens, metal monuments that corrode in the atmosphere. His work reminds us further of just how many material means and temporalities there are to deconstruction, analog or digital. Quote, forms implode, matter is carbonized or pulverized. Most of these transformations are visible, Metzger wrote. Yet in autodestructive art, a great deal of activity takes place on the microscopic level and is not seen, end quote. Corrosion by acid or atmosphere, burning up from overwork or arson, implosion by explosives or the long durée of decay, all things conservators aim to protect and all processes that unfold at variable speeds thus become, quote, intrinsic parts of the artwork, end quote. Metzger's various pieces could take anywhere from 20 seconds to 20 years to die. We see this variation in material processes, scale, and temporality copied in Agrippa, too. And ultimately, we are made aware of the many fronts on which the larger preservation battle is so often waged. Deconstruction art defies preservation, although many cultural institutions devise solutions to transform the ephemeral and processual into something collectible. In his fantastic master's thesis for the Museum Studies Program at the University of Leicester, John D. Powell notes that these institutions often take into account the artist's intention in making decisions regarding preservation. Some institutions preserve the material residue from ruinous performances, as MoMA have, has done with uh, some remains of Tongley's homage to New York. And notably, much of this preserved detritus is then classified as painting or sculpture, a very different format than what the original um, performance was. Others consider strategies of documenting the performance of destruction, yet doing so presumes to make reproducible a destructive act that was never meant to be so. And D.A. Pennebecker actually worked with Tongley to document the, the big fiery act in MoMA's courtyard, sculpture garden. 
Well, many of the digital projects I mentioned earlier seem to embody similarly destructive, or on the lighter end of the spectrum, parodic values. And to highlight the futility of preservation, it's important to remember that there's a creative dimension of destruction, too. Projects like Ono's Cut Piece and Jody's Jet Set Willy, in their making strange or making problematic, also make us question our choices to destroy or preserve, and the aesthetic and epistemological and political consequences of those choices. They create an awareness of the aesthetics and politics of destruction and preservation, acts that today become so radically casualized with click to save or drag to delete. What's more, Stiles argues that deconstruction art and its refusal to be collected and circulated has the potential to, to quote, recover the social force of art from instrumental reason and the economics of late capitalism, end quote. It also reinforces, quote, the survivability of the body, the very materiality of existence, end quote. Again, reinforcing some many points that Matt made earlier. I think this is the last section. Vitrines, vision machines, and other aestheticized technologies of preservation. Quite a mouthful. <coughs> now, many of these dis destruction works aren't explicitly about preservation, and that they're not overtly critiquing the practice and aesthetics of preservation itself, outside of highlighting their own unpreservability. Yet there are a host of others, inspired by the archival and museological turns in contemporary art, and by the rise of what's called an institutional critique, who take the aesthetics and politics of preservation as central, even if implicit, themes in their work. Take the Astor Gates, whose Dorchester projects, a group of reclaimed buildings in Chicago that have been refashioned into a local arts and culture center, which includes a slide library, slide lantern library acquired from the University of Chicago, Oak and LP collections acquired from the now defunct Prairie Avenue Bookshop and Dr. Wax Records, and the library of John H. Johnson, founder of Ebony and Jet Magazines. The assemblage of media and architecture inspires its immediate south side, south side Chicago community and the global audience that studies Gates' work to consider the significance of preserving others' cast off media and of integrating these collections into a vibrant, multi, multi purpose community space. It also prompts us to consider the roles of these, these specific materials architecture books, ethnic publications, for instance played in constructing Chicago's and especially black Chicago's history a history that other institutions had to deaccession in order for Gates to step in as conservator. Consider also Mark Dion, uh, whose work frequently involves combing and dredging riverbeds and flea markets and existing museum collections, and staging his, his finds and displays that deter traditional museological conventions. He's asking how preservation and classification and display structure and display structure our cultural representations of and relationships to nature. With all its vitrines and labels and dioramas, Dion's work is ostensibly about preservation, but it too has a destructive element. As critic Martha Schwendener argues, Dion is, quote, dedicated to highlighting and undermining enlightened values through the use of his own formal vocabulary. Just the act of looking at Dion's work all those books, photos, drawings, specimens, and found objects can be fatiguing, end quote. And in one of his early works, Artful History, a Restoration Comedy from 1988, Dion and Jason Simon offer a mock public television documentary on the work of a commercial restoration studio, where they hear tragic comic <coughs> tales of aesthetic forgery and preservation, historic paintings cut in two to increase their resale value, damaged sculptures with limbs sutured on from other pieces, forgeries passed off as authentic. In the gallery, Dion accompanies this film with strips of paintings cut from works whose restoration was deemed too expensive or cumbersome. According to the curators of the 1988 Whitney Independent Study Show, The Desire of the Museum, which included Dion's film, artful history demonstrates that restoration, quote, responds to the prompts of art dealers and museum curators as they alter paintings to suit format requirements and marketplace, sorry, marketplace pressures, end quote. Preservation here is thus driven by an aesthetic informed by display and commercial values, not by ensuring intrinsic value. Yet as with much autodestructive art, the aesthetic exhaustion of Dion's installations and the aesthetic deception in his film are also epistemologically generative. Schwindener makes the case quite poignantly. She writes, what he recreates in his art stim simulates the fatigue of Western history, 
The headlong rush to conquer, acquire, accumulate, collect, classify, arrange, display, reconfigure, reconstruct, restore, preserve, and represent. Art for Dion is both academic, evoking a history lesson or a science project, and highly social, working in idiosyncratic ways. He reminds us of how effective art can be when it collapses these, uh, these varieties of experience, end quote. We see many of these themes echoed through a similarly exhausting aesthetic of preservation and classification in the work of Camille Henron, uh, particularly in her Gross Fatigue, a video based on her 19, sorry, not 1913, her 2013 artist residency at the Smithsonian. Within the aesthetics of the interface, she contrasts different materialities and aesthetics of preservation. Fish in a preservative bath, tagged bird carcasses in a drawer, proliferating browser windows and books and magazines and hard drive stuffed with gifts, and even technicians working in a natural history museum's preservation lab. This windows within windows within windows layering of these analog and digital preservation systems, suggests Pamela Lee, Pamela Lee at Art Forum, shows the digital windows and screens to be, quote, just as flattened out and drained of life as all of those sorry animal carcasses accumulating in cold storage, end quote. I can't tell you how much I love this video. I saw it at the New Museum a couple months ago, and I wish I could say more about it, but I must move on. Um, so, so for artist Anne Hamilton, however, preservation is fully embodied and vital and social, unlike the dead animal carcasses. <laughs> Much of Hamilton's work engages with the materiality and sociality of communication and historical artifacts, and how that materiality determines what constitutes a culture's archive. Through the material abundance of her work, and through its lack of familiarity to typical archival architectures, Hamilton's work allows its inhabitants to create new, unfamiliar, affective connections to history. It calls attention to the limitations of the official historical record and suggests means of refreshing the archive's architectures and materials with alternative sources that don't always readily lend themselves to preservation. Hamilton often uses quotidian materials, from bread to blue jeans to pink pearl erasers, and a variety of media formats to form inhabitable, multi-sensory archival landscapes. At our 2012 The Event of a Thread at the Park Avenue Armory in New York, we found newspaper, eight and a half by 11 lined paper covered with handwriting, scrolls covered with typewritten text, pigeons, which, in one, which once like the horse served as vital means of communication, vinyl record engravers, erasers, bells, bellows, radios, and the voice. In these installations, which commonly engage the histories of their sites, she creates palimpsestic landscapes by layering sight, sound, smell, taste, and texture, then activating the scene with simple repeated movements, or what Clark, Len Clark Lunbury calls accretions of gesture. Her indigo blue and tropos, for instance, other installations, involve someone sitting at a table, <coughs> unmaking a book through erasure by burning away the text line by line. Rather than an act of destruction, however, this unmaking represented the means of, quote, clearing the field, making room, according to Hamilton, for another material kind of telling. She reminds us, as did many of the female destruction artists I mentioned earlier, of the body itself as the site or means of preservation and or destruction. I took my graduate archives and libraries class to see the event of a thread, where several students commented on the various kinds of labor or performance represented in the installation. We had official participants, including Hamilton herself, who you see here, the lucky she was there when we were there, reading and writing and erasing and singing and recording. And we, the visitors, labored on our swings. You can see this big curtain with, there are hundreds, I don't know how many, dozens of swings that you could ride on to create air to move the curtain in the center. So we moved on our swings to move a giant curtain strung across the center of the armory. Hamilton's work addresses, in her words, quote, the way the body through physical labor leaves a transparent presence in material and how labor is a way of knowing, end quote. How do we preserve these transparent presences? How do we ensure those quotidian gestures, that invisible labor, those unheard voices are registered in the historical record? What defies recording and preservation? These are among the questions Hamilton's work raises for me. She proposes that a history rooted not only in extraordinary events, but also in the everyday, its artifacts, sensations, labor, simple gestures, requires an archive that is embodied, material, and living. Then again, what if there are aspects of the everyday that we simply don't want to be recordable and preservable? This is where my final anti-preservation aesthetic, aesthetic, 
ketosterol comes in. Her films and writing focus on the ubiquity and digital dis global distribution of images, including images that reduce identity to data. Quote, identity goes far beyond a relationship with images, she says. It entails a set of private keys, passwords, etc., that can be expropriated and detorned. More generally, identity is the name of the battlefield over your code, be it genetic, informational, pictorial, end quote. One of the battles being waged is the right to exempt, exempt or extract oneself from Leviathan's database to regain some control over how one's identity is constructed. Her 2013 How Not to Be Seen, a expletive uh, didactic educational MOV file, MOV file, she actually specifies the file name in the uh, piece title, offers several strategies for disappearing oneself from the database, for rendering oneself unpreservable. That's my term. Possible approaches? Camouflage yourself. Hide in plain sight. Shrink yourself down smaller than a pixel. Live in a gated community. Wear a full body cloak. Or become a female over 50. <laughs> <laughs> Sterile also know, acknowledges the entwined virtuality of the image and the materiality of the infrastructures that make their capture, capture and circulation possible. In order to thwart the circulation and preservation of our identities as data sets, we sometimes have to simply rage against the machine, kill the drones, pull a 1984, and smash the screen. In Strike, which is currently on exhibit in Chelsea, along with the aforementioned video, uh, she strikes an LCD screen to make visible the structures structuring our viewing, to show that, quote, images also have a physical existence, end quote. The implication is that we need to understand the physical infrastructures of surveillance and data mining in order to undermine it. And thus we're back to destruction but again, epistemologically generative destruction. These are destructive practices that strive to reassert, as Stiles puts it, the very materiality of existence, to recover the archive and the human subjectivities it documents from instrumental reason and the econ economies of late capitalism. By aestheticizing the intellectual and technical and social infrastructures that undergird choices regarding what gets preserved and how and why, by playing out specul speculative limit cases of what our museums and archives and databases can do, by making sensible of the cracks and leaks in the system, by demonstrating what's lost and gained in storing and managing and migrating and reinterpreting our cultural productions, these artists, working in media of myriad materialities, demonstrate how aesthetics can pose powerful questions about the ethics and politics of what you all do. And they can ideally inspire creative ways for rethinking about destructive preservation, for approaches to conservation that are anything but conservative. So, thank you. <laughs>